That's Same thing, I guess. Do. Editing is okay, but to understand, if I do say that, it's literally not because I don't understand the question, but because I didn't even register the question, right? I mean, yeah, I we, yeah. totally. If if you have any okay. uh, questions like that, please don't hesitate to ask. We want uh, okay. we want to be on the same page, and it's no not a problem to dumb right. triple check anything <laughs> if, if i answer <laughs> second time still not clear please let me know yes so okay the recording has started um okay just a second and just Hello, dear viewers. Welcome to the Creative Society channel. And today here with us, we have Michael Albert as our guest. He is an economist from uh, New England, and we're going to have an interview on economical topics today. Michael, w welcome to our show. It's it's a great pleasure having you today. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Could you please sh uh, tell us a little bit about yourself for the viewers and introduce yourself? Sure, I guess so. Um, my name, as you said, is Michael Albert. I I work a lot in media. I'm not really a professional economist. I was just was trained in economics. Um, I became active in trying to seek a better world back in the 60s and have been active ever since. Uh, I guess the... Uh, main things that i've done in so far as it may be relevant to your your event here your show is uh a lot of media activism uh with a site called znet magazine school etc cetera, etc cetera. and um a lot of work on uh economic vision that is to say uh being against capitalism being against the ills that uh, this particular kind of economy breeds. Um, I used to confront a long time ago the question, yeah, I get what you don't like. You know, I, I've heard that. I get that. But what do you want? And so a long time ago, I and a friend named Robin Hanel started to focus in on that question because we thought it was a perfectly fair question. And uh, so we slowly developed what what's called now participatory economics, a, a, a vision of a post-capitalist approach to uh economic life yeah uh so we that that is exactly how we found you we found you as a person who actually suggested solutions and could you t please tell us a little bit more about participatory economics or parkon as uh, uh, they also call it and uh, what what is this concept about and what what is it founded on Okay, so it starts from inevitably uh, not liking the system we have. And if you want to, I can go into that, but I won't now because it's not what you asked about. But but that's where it germinated, if you will, back in the 60s, activism, the anti-war movement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, encountering that question, we began to think, okay, um, what's an economy? Well, it's a set of institutions that accomplish production, consumption, and allocation you know, the distribution of stuff. And um, so we started thinking about, okay, what would a good set of institutions, uh, a good economy be? And the first thing we had to figure out was, well, what do we want our economy to accomplish? Um, and beyond accomplishing production, consumption, and allocation in accord with human needs, desires, fulfillment, development, we realized that an economy affects a lot. It affects much more than just the stuff that it generates. And so what it affects is, for example, relations between people, the extent who makes decisions and in what manner, um, the, uh, the way income is distributed, um, the range of options that are available. And so thinking about that stuff, we came up with a vision and in very brief nutshell, the vision is based upon just a few central or core institutions, um, workers and consumers, self-managing councils, where self-managing means people should have a say in decisions in proportion to the extent to which the decisions affect them. Um, if you say that you're going to have workers in workplaces, 
essentially managing the workplace, self-managing the workplace, then it's essential that the workers all be in a position to do that, um, be prepared by their circumstances um, to do a good job of that. And we realized then that there was, uh, it wasn't just that there was private ownership and therefore owners making all the decisions, not workers, not consumers either, but owners. Um, but there was something else that was an impediment, and that was the division of labor. Um, we called it corporate division of labor, the one that's familiar, not only in capitalism, but also in the thing that was called, and I guess it's still called, 20th century socialism. And that division of labor basically divides up tasks in such a way that about 20% of employees of the total workforce are doing all the empowering tasks and 80% are doing tasks that they're disempowering. Um, so the empowered sector, the 20% uh, dominates decision-making and dominates outcomes and also enriches itself and so on. Uh, so we wanted to get rid of that. So we came up with something that we call balanced job complexes, which was a way to do work um, that apportions empowering tasks comparably to all uh, and disempowering tasks comparably to all. So everybody is prepared to participate in that workers' council. And then came along the issue of income distribution. Well, if some people are getting the great bulk of the, of the wealth and other people are getting a small fraction of the wealth, again, there's going to be a, a dominance and submission relationship between those two groups. So we have to do away with that. And uh, what we came up with, I won't go into any detail, I mean, you can pursue anything you want, but what we came up with, again, in a nutshell, is that people should get income, a share of the social product, for uh, the duration of work we do, for the um, intensity of work we do, how hard we work, and for the onerousness of the conditions under which we work. This is almost the exact opposite of what pertains in economies throughout history and now um, in the world. And we call that equitable remuneration uh, with the one caveat that the work has to be socially desired. And then it turned out that uh, as we looked at it, markets and central planning each obstructed these innovations, each created a situation which, which subverted the others and indeed would undo the others. So you couldn't use markets or central planning. And so we thought about that and came up with something that we call participatory planning, which is a different approach to that. And maybe I should just say one last point. Um, that, that discussion of the corporate division of labor, and it also comes up with respect to allocation, said that there's a, another group, not just owners, who can dominate economic outcomes. And that other group is much bigger. It's not 1% or 2%. It's more like 20%. And that group can become, if you will, a ruling class above the rest of workers who are excluded from empowering tasks. And so part of what participatory economics is, is uh, having economic uh, interactions and institutions propel, facilitate those values that I mentioned, self-management, diversity, solidarity, um, equity. And it's partly sort of a different variant of the same thing to eliminate class division and class rule. <clears throat> Sorry, to eliminate class division and class rule, which means getting rid of that division between empowered employees and disempowered employees. And so that's participatory economics. That is very interesting. Those pillars to me sound very interesting. But what, why do what do you think is the relevance um, to the current situation in economic? Uh, what how do you see? Uh, how do you see these changes? How do you see a demand for these changes? And what creates conditions for uh, necessity and relevance of these ideas to be actually implemented? Uh -huh. Um, that, of course, is the, is the important question. I agree with you. Um, you can be moved in the present by your opposition to current problems, right? And, and should be, right? So we should be looking around, seeing what 
is problematic, seeing what hurts, seeing what oppresses, and moving against those things. But you can also be moved by what it is you want. So, for instance, an anarchist slogan was plant the seeds of the future in the present. So, in other words, when you confront low wages, let's say, or you confront uh, an allocation system that is generating pollution that risks the planet, or you confront a situation in which inside the workplace you have a level of say that is basically not at all, because you're a worker, not a not a manager. So you have virtually no impact. You're in a you're in an environment that is more authoritarian in many respects than, say, a political dictatorship. In a political dictatorship, the dictator doesn't tell you what you can wear. The dictator doesn't tell you, you know, when you can go to the bathroom. But in a workplace, the owner does, in fact, tell you those things. And so now, how do you respond to those things? Well, you try to formulate demands for changes that alleviate some of the pain, that reduce some of the injustice. Perfectly good. But if you do that and you don't orient also toward the future, it's not clear where you'll wind up. If you pay attention to, say, let's give those examples, um, low wages. So you demand a, uh, a, a higher um, a minimum income, right? You demand a, a higher uh, minimum wage that can be paid. Okay. And if you win that, when you win that, that's a positive gain. But when you're doing that, have you begun to develop an awareness and a consciousness of what's really equitable? And have you developed aspirations for what's really equitable? Or in doing that, have you developed only the aspiration for, let's say, $15 an hour or $20 an hour, and you win and you go home, right? Two very different pictures. One, you're fighting for a reform in a reformist manner, in a manner that sort of accepts the basic underlying definition of the economy. And in the second approach, you're fighting for the, the same reform, right? A $15 an hour minimum wage or a $20 an hour minimum wage. But you're fighting for it in a way which is saying this is just a step, right? It's a step toward real equitable income distribution and which is formulating and trying to create means to fight on. To fight on for what? For the new economy. If you don't do that, one possibility is that you win some and benefit some and don't keep going and you know the basics aren't touched that's one possibility another possibility is that you win some and it does keep going but it keeps going someplace you don't want to go right toward a new kind of economy in which 20 percent rule 80 percent and the best result i think and this you know is because of I like participatory economics, if you will, is that you fight for the higher minimum wage, but you do it in a way that leads you toward a trajectory of battles aimed at the new, the new form of economy. Now, the same thing is true if you're talking about, say, allocation and pollution, or if you're talking about uh, the level of, of say that people have in their, in their daily life in the workplace. You can fight for changes that are... Um, you know, real, that help people, that matter, and that we fight for, but you can do it in more than one way. Uh, one way that gains and then loses back again later, say social democracy, like in Scandinavia, um, in a way that fights for change and wins and then gets something fundamental. But what it gets is, if you will, Soviet-style so-called socialism, which has nothing in common with workers controlling their own lives, consumers controlling their own lives, and so on. Or you fight for something and you win, um, you know, what, what would really be classless and desirable. Mm -hmm. So it informs the present by helping you find the things that it's worth fighting about, 
by helping you find ways to fight about those things that lead toward where you want to go. And it is very relevant in both those respects. Let me say one last thing. I'm sorry to go on, but there's another respect in it's in which it's relevant to now. And that's not for the organizer. In some sense, what I just said was for the organizer, right? How to identify things to fight about, how to organize the way you fight about those things, what to say about them, what consciousness to raise about. What about the broad population? I think it's relevant there because I think the broad population, and this is how we started with participatory economics, wants to know where are we going, right? What is, what do you, why do you want me to take what little time I have to enjoy anything about life, given my work in the factory and everything else, right? And, and apply it to being in a movement. Why do you want me to fight when it looks to me like if I fight, it's a lost cause before I begin. And even if I do get some place, there's no ultimate place to get to. There is no alternative. So when Margaret Thatcher said there is no alternative, it's a very, very effective tool for getting people to do nothing, to not fight at all, to not oppose injustice at all. Because what it's saying is that's the way the cookie crumbles. That's the way it has to be. So make the best of it. Um, but don't try and change it because there is no such change. You're wasting your time. And so the vision helps overcome the cynicism and the passivity and the hopelessness, as well as informing struggle. I guess that's, a, I think that's the essence of why I concern myself with vision. Nice. So there is a huge amount of efforts that has been like, uh, applied by multiple people around the world for fighting just to make this minimum wage one dollar more than what it is right now and basically this is this is wasting your time for something that if you just change your goal by a little bit you can achieve so much more and in a much uh, much bigger well, perspective right almost i mean i don't think that fighting for reforms is wasting time in other words, mm -hmm. fighting for a fifteen hour, fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, or then a twenty dollar minimum wage, and so on, or fighting for, uh, I don't know, some system in the workplace that allows you to register grievances, let's say, and have an oversight committee that deals with grievances. That was the self management one, <laughs> or fighting for um, pollution controls and penalties. Those things are all reforms. Those things don't fundamentally change the system. They don't give us a new economy, but fighting for those things is part of what awakens awareness and desire and um, a sense of confidence that one can achieve more. And fighting for those things in ways, as you say, that is not confined to the benefits of the small change, which are real, right? But is also talking about the benefits of a comprehensive change and and trying to lay the seeds for the groundwork for continuing to fight until one wins that that basic fundamental change. Um, look, there there are obviously global warming and global ecological dissolution is a major. I mean, it isn't just a major problem, right? It's a suicidal march toward oblivion is what it really is and so that's a that's a fundamental thing that has to be dealt with or or we're we're doomed right so but somebody comes along and says well you know fighting for this reform relevant to um uh global warming it's just a reform. We have to change the whole system. There's no victory until we change the whole system. Just focus on the whole system. Win socialism, win anarchism, win participatory economics. Short of that, there's nothing. That's wrong, right? That is fundamentally and very dangerously wrong. Why? Well, if we could win participatory economics tomorrow, it would be right, right? I mean, you know, th then it would be right. But if it's going to take 10 years, 20 years, 50 years to fundamentally transform the economies and the social systems throughout the world, 
um, we don't have 10, 20, or 50 years to deal with, or at least to begin to deal with those other things. And it isn't just global warming. It's also poverty. It's people dying unnecessarily of hunger. It's, it's all sorts of things which need to be dealt with on the road to a better society. And it's also the case that you don't wake up one day and go from passively living in, depressed that you can't do better, but living in the current system, to all of a sudden fighting for a completely different system, right? That happens through a process of change and of development that comes about largely in the act of fighting for those shorter run gains in a non-reformist way. Um, or at Thank least it, that seems to be true. Yeah, that makes sense. So making balance between the long-term and short-term goals. Yeah. At what level do you see the possibility of implementation, the participatory economic economy? Uh, should it be at the like corporate or private entity level or country level, state level, or should it be implemented worldwide? And how how exactly do you see that? Happening? See, it's the same. It's the same problem in a sense. Suppose somebody says, um, well, until we have it worldwide, we don't have it and, and we don't have anything. And therefore, look, back in the 60s, we used to have a slogan, we want the world and we want it now, right? The sentiment was fine. The logic, not so good, right? Because it meant people were screaming about and myself included, about you know a new society and weren't paying attention to the need to win gains and institutionalize them, creating grounds upon which we could win more gains. Um, as to what level it could work at, uh, suppose there's a workplace and the uh, owners decide that the change in the current climate in the economy is such that they're going to balk, they're going to they're walk. They don't think that they can earn profits anyway, so they're, they're, they want to punt. They want to leave. Uh, and suppose even that the managers, the 20% engineers, lawyers, et cetera, who were associated with this big workplace decide, well, with the owner gone, this is surely doomed. I'm going to. Now, what do the workers do? Well, this happened in Argentina around the turn of the century, or at the turn of this century, around 20 years ago. Um, uh, not quite. The, what do they do? Well, they could also give up and walk out, or they could take over the workplace. So when you ask at what level, it can be at the level of a single workplace. Can Does that single workplace institute participatory economics in its entirety? No, because it's still functioning a market system. There's capitalism all around. But inside that workplace, could you institute a new division of labor? Could you institute workers' councils and workers' self-management? Yes, you could do those things. Um, could you institute equitable incomes? Yes, you could do that. Um, would the market be pushing against what you're doing? Yes. Would the banks be pushing against what you're doing? Yes. The whole, But you can still do it. So the answer to the question is you can institute elements of participatory economic vision at um, any level, let's say you create a commune in Venezuela that produces food and the surrounding town, right, uses the food. The market still exists. Venezuela is still a capitalist country. The market still exists, but the commune is participatory economic oriented. And so are lots of people in the town. So they meet together, the the production commune and the, and the geographic commune of the town and they say look we don't think that we should exchange based on market prices we think we should talk about things discuss things and figure out how we're going to exchange and interact with one another well that's that's not participatory planning which is the institution of participatory economics but it's moving toward it so you can see how now we've got not just the local workplace, but we've got uh, a, 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 ge a small geographic region trying to implement this kind of stuff.
Say you've got an apartment building. Now you're consumers who live in this apartment building. And what do you consume? Well, you're consuming the housing and you're and you also of course consume food and all sorts of other things suppose you decide you know we believe in this ultimate vision of participatory economics so we're going to form a um a council of the people inside the building and we're going to relook at things we're going to look at why there are elderly people on the fifth floor and young people on the first floor and we're going to trade apartments we're going to look at the amount of food that we waste and we're going to create a food co-op um, in order to... So in other words, you start to implement the elements of the vision that you desire at that level. And then you can obviously imagine doing it at you know, a state level or at a country level, and it could happen at an international level. Um, the, the process, the transition, if you will, is not simple. Um, and, and to make believe it is, is just silly. It's not simple, but um, it is essential uh, because in the long run, it's not just a matter of looking at the ills now and ameliorating the pain, mitigating the pain. It's also a matter that the, the economic structure that we have keeps producing the pain, keeps producing the injustice, keeps producing the destruction of the environment, and so you, you have to go beyond um, uh, guarding against those, even though that's a desirable thing to do, to replacing the underlying causes. And that mm -hmm. means getting rid of private ownership of the means of production. It means getting rid of the corporate division of labor. It means getting rid of markets. It means getting rid of um, you know, income distribution for bargaining power and for property. It means getting rid of all those things and replacing it with institutions that generate instead of pain um self-management and equity and uh diversity and uh um you know environmental sustainability etc and that's what that's what participatory economics tries to uh attain that is a very interesting concept so steps can be taken on any level but do you think that uh, participatory economics can be built in a single country or s small group of countries or just partially in some oh. part of the world? Okay, so the Cubans made a revolution. They did not institute participatory economics, right? Although there was some debate that circled a little around that. But they, they instead instituted what um, has been called 20th century socialism. Did it have a lot of advantages for them? Even with the boycotts and everything else, the, the, also the terrorism that was waged against them and so on, did it have a lot of advantages? Yes. So it turns out that, you know, Cuban literacy rates are higher than the United States now, a lot higher, actually. And Cuban healthcare is in many respects better, even with the boycott and, and even with the, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the pressure against other countries to relate. What would have happened had they instituted participatory economics? <laughs> Honestly, I think in that case, it probably would have been, the response would have been even worse from the United States um, and more aggressive. So it's a difficult question. Um, the way the world is constituted right now, I think it would be very difficult for any country to implement participatory economics and beyond that participatory society. That is to say, also um, revolutionizing kinship relations and cultural relations and political relations. It would be very hard to do that fully because of the military and economic clout of the United States and the fact that the United States would so viciously oppose it. Um, uh, so that would make it very, very difficult, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible to get partway there. That is possible. And also it doesn't mean that it's impossible to do it in the United States and therefore defang the main international obstacle, um, by, uh, uh, creating strong enough movements so that the United States couldn't intervene the way it would like to. And, you know, that's our task. 
I mean, you know, we can't choose to live. We can't choose to say, well, everything is hunky dory. We don't have to worry about. We do have to worry about that kind of thing. We do have to worry about American interventionism. We do have to worry about just how incredibly violent and I don't know what you want to call it. Amoral is relevant, but it's um, intent upon preserving its own system and power. Um, I mean, right now, American elites and elites in many other countries are behaving in a manner that 50 years from now will be deemed literally pathological. I mean, literally pathological because they are pursuing paths that are suicidal. Um, And why do they do it? It's because first they can't perceive that um, because their minds are oriented to profit and to power. And they, that's what they understand. And um, second that some of them even probably can sort of perceive it, but they feel hopeless the way a citizen feels hopeless that they are, that they are themselves cogs in a machine. So, you know, American Congress people, senators, probably even people in the cabinet, maybe Biden himself, right? What they feel late at night when they're talking in private about how bad things are is probably closer to what a sane person should feel, right? But what they do is constrained by all kinds of pressures and constraints upon their thought and their actions. Um, And that's why you have to make systemic change. It isn't just a matter of putting a better person in power. That can be part of the process, right? It can be part of the process that you elect a bunch of people who then reveal the, the, the perverse logic of the system and start proposing real alternatives. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. But notice they won't be, they'll be doing that in opposition. Um, which is good, but it's not that they will be in a position to just keep pulling levers and making things better. Um, We see that isn't the case. That requires grassroots strength. That requires organization and activism. I absolutely agree with you. Without the grassroots demand from the people, it's really hard to make any of those changes. And yeah. something you brought up earlier was planning. So I wanted to ask you about the planning part. What role does it play in participatory economics? Play. Sure. Um, well, one kind of planning is there are planners, and then there's the economy and the public. And in essence, it's this. The planners do some calculations, blah, blah, blah. And then they um, they um, send to the workplaces instructions. And the workplaces receive those instructions and look at them. And they say whether they can do them or not, basically. And the planners get that information. And then they send a different set, a a slightly refined set of instructions, and the workplaces respond again. And then they send orders, and the workplaces enact the orders. And moreover, the planners are not interested in interacting with the entire workforce. The planners want to interact with somebody in the workplace like themselves. That is, somebody who is one of those empowered 20% or a board of people who wanted to, or were of those that empowered 20%. And so you have this class structure and you have a top-down decision-making framework in which the workers are not making decisions. They're just providing some information. And really it's not even the workers who are doing that. It's the managerial group inside the workplace that's doing that. So that's the kind of planning that we don't want. That's the kind of planning that I think is consistent with and even produces that class division that I described and coordinator class above worker class, empowered workers above disempowered workers, and also distorts economic outcomes in various ways. So if you don't want that, what do you want? Well, this isn't rocket science because there's not that much else that you could want. What you want is a mechanism 
by which workers and consumers, because remember self-management, you have a say in decisions to the degree you're affected. So economic decisions affect workers, but they also affect consumers, right? Same people in different hats, but the economic decisions affect both. And so people should have a say in what they consume, in what kinds of things are made available, in what they produce, in how they produce. And so what are you saying you want? Well, you're saying you want workers and consumers councils, decision-making bodies. But now what's allocation? Well, now allocation has to be some kind of um, interaction between those workers' councils and workers are making decisions and those consumers' councils and consumers are making decisions in which information is flowing and a plan is emerging, right? That's sort of the logic. That's, that's what you want. You want a system in which you get a plan and it's a worthy plan. It's a viable plan. It has all the, the attributes that you want. It meets needs. It develops potentials. It's workable. Um, and the plan is an outcome of the aspirations of and the decision-making influence of workers' councils and consumers' councils. That's what participatory planning is. So it's a mechanism in which, by which workers' and consumers' councils make proposals right? They, they receive information about those proposals, and then they modify their proposals, and then they receive information about their, in other words, they're not receiving information from a, a board of planners. There is no board of planners. They're not receiving, it's not, there's nothing top down. There's no center or periphery, right? There are just workers' councils and consumers' councils, and a mechanism by which they can express what they want, what they desire to do, and have that information percolate, let's call it, through to the producers who produce what they want to consume and the consumers who will consume what they want to produce. And there's a modification of proposals on each side until you get to a plan. So in the broad, you know, now you can refine this by, by describing exactly how the iterations, the successive rounds of planning occur by explaining how the valuations of prices uh, are, are arrived at, et cetera, et cetera. That's too much for this interview, I think, but it's not beyond, it's, it's not rocket science. It, it's doable and it's understandable and we make a case that it, it is both viable, it can be done, and it's worthy, it yields good outcomes. And it's consistent with classlessness, doesn't require a ruling class. It's consistent with self-management by the people involved. And it's consistent with equity, the remuneration that is in accord with, or income that's in accord with duration, intensity, and onerousness. So participatory economics is a few core institutions. An actual participatory economy will involve much more than that, of course, right? Uh, just like a capital, an, a, an average capitalist economy isn't just that there's private ownership and there's markets and there's a corporate division of labor and there's a remuneration for bargaining power. It's much beyond that, right? It's, it's, it's a ton beyond that. But the core institutions are those few that I mentioned. Um, what does this say about um, now? Well, it says that we don't like markets and we don't like central planning. We think they both are um, antithetical to the values that we hold dear. On the other hand, we're not insane. We know that markets are going to be around for a while. And in some cases, central planning is going to be around for a while. And for that matter, inside large corporations right now, central planning is what's done. So in other words, if you take General Motors or you take, you take any law or Amazon, right? Um, inside Amazon, they don't have markets to determine, you know, what goes where in the workplace. They have central planning, Right. It's literally centrally planned, and these institutions are big. Some of them are humongous. So, so we have some central planning, and we have some markets, and we don't want either. 
And that means that now we try to make proposals that are moving us toward participatory planning, creating workers and consumers councils, starting to have those councils um, intervene in in the allocation process and so on and so forth. And uh, it's important because, can I tell you a story? Do we have time? Do we have a little time? All right. So I was in Argentina um, after what I described, an Argentine economic crisis, which caused literally lots and lots and lots of workplaces, hundreds, I think, over the court, over all of Argentina, right, to have their owners leave and to then have uh, the, the managers and the engineers and so on leave. And workers were left with sitting there in the workplaces and they decided to take them over so in many 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 cases workers took over these workplaces and the workers uh well i so i visited and i'm in a room with representatives from about 50 of those workplaces and i'm supposed to give a talk about participatory economics and so on so before we start It's very congenial, you know, people are having a good time because they're meeting people from other parts of Argentina who are doing like they're doing. And and they're all excited about that. And so we say, well, let's just start by going around the room a little bit, introducing and um, saying a bit about what's going on. So we do that. And by the time it gets to, and it was the seventh person, the room has gone from elation, excitement, you know, sharing, et cetera, to almost maudlin, right? To a sense of, of, of pain, of depression. What happened? Person after person described how they took over the workplace. They um, instituted a workers' council. They instituted that workers would control and would vote majority vote they um corrected the wage structure now they didn't do these things entirely in accord with participatory economics but they certainly were moving way very much toward it and for the sake of discussion let's let's assume they did it all the way <clears throat> so they have self-managing workers council they have um equitable remuneration for how long and how hard you work under worse conditions person working under worse conditions gets more income that's the opposite of now and it's the opposite of now because the person working under worse conditions has less power which is why they're working under worse conditions the person who's working under more con- better conditions has more power and the money goes to the power okay but anyway back to the venezuelan case and then they said and the, yeah, the last one to speak right was said basically i never thought i would say anything like this but maybe margaret thatcher was right she's the one who said there is no alternative maybe margaret thatcher is right we took over the owner is gone hell the the lawyers are gone we're in in charge and all the old crap is coming back It, it it just feels like it's 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 getting alienated again. It just feels like it's becoming the way it was. And so after about seven of these things and depression setting in, um, I said, okay, let me, let me just try and, and relate to this. And I said to them, when you took over, did you keep the old division of labor? And they didn't know what I meant. And I said, well, did you keep the jobs that had, hap- that had existed before and just fill them with, you know, with people? And they said, yes, of course. What else could you do? And I said, well, see, I think I think you I believe you feel like what's happening is that human nature is screwing up your aspirations and human nature is leading your workplaces to be alienated and again, hierarchical. And and they agreed. They said, yeah, that is what it feels like. There is no alternative. It's just the way it is. It's human beings. And I said, well, I don't think it's that. I think it's that you kept an old institution, the corporate division of labor, and that that institution has 
perverted your aspirations. It has led some of you to be more empowered, to be more confident, to be taking more initiative, and others of you the opposite. And the some are starting to dominate the others. And the domination is leading even to their raising their own wages and lowering yours. And re- and it turned out this was, of course, correct. It's not, again, it's not rocket science. It's It's pretty simple once you know once one understands it but the point was that their inattention to a particular institution was causing their effort to create a better economy to be subverted and the same thing happens with markets and central plans so this is the importance of institutions institutions can create a context in which they call forth certain kinds of behavior and they yield certain kinds of outcomes, regardless of people's desires. It didn't matter that these people wanted real equity, wanted real participation. They preserved something that subverted that. And so I can't remember exactly where we started, but um, Th- this is why we we propose this thing called balanced job complexes mm-hmm. uh, because if you don't have that if you don't get rid of whatever institutions generate not just you know reflect but generate the differences in income wealth and particularly power then the, all the old crap will come back just like the person said it was um and so so we can't only be against capitalism. We have to be for something that avoids the problems. Um, uh, we, yeah. we also know from the 50s and the 70s that uh, attempts to make planned decentralized economy were taken in Yugoslavia. And uh, uh, maybe we could learn anything from that experience, just as from Argentina. Yeah, there were some Yugoslav activists and, I don't know, writers, theoreticians, whatever you want to call these people, right, who were indeed trying to propose um, a a truly more participatory approach to planning. That's true. Um, But just like those workers in that workplace in Argentina, right, who their their aspirations were one thing and the results were another thing. And the same was true in Yugoslavia. The aspirations of some were one thing, but the preservation of the corporate division of labor and the preservation of elements of allocation from the past were subverting it. And so there was a, a struggle, right? This happened in Cuba too, but it was uh, somewhat different. So, uh, uh, so, and the struggle wasn't won, so to speak, by the side seeking classlessness, seeking self-management. Um, so it, it's an important experiment, and there are things to learn from it, I think. But um, it didn't. It didn't ultimately succeed. It's you know people think that okay, if something fails that means nothing is possible. That's what those workers in the Argentine factory felt, right? That their thing going bad, their workplace going bad, meant there is no alternative. There is no better society. Um, But it didn't mean that. It meant that their effort had a flaw, had some flaws that, you know, that we had to do better. Rosa Luxemburg, a famous German revolutionary, once said there is... You lose, you lose, you lose, you win. Um, And I at least take that to mean, and I think she meant, um, when you lose, there are lessons. And um, you only have to win once. Um, So you're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose, or you're going to get a partial victory, a partial victory, a partial victory. You need to learn the lessons, and you need to apply the lessons in such a way that you, you finally win and game over you've won mm-hmm. um and uh there was 
There was another another example of uh, planned economy trying to be implemented in uh, South America. It was Chile when Salvador Allende gathered in the sure. early 70s all the scientists in the field of uh, cyber science and they tried to do this planned yep. economy model which would work uh you know based on ai algorithms the very the very primitive ones comparing to the technologies we have today and that experiment was going quite successful you would say that the numbers were going up till some point when the system was destroyed and after that for some reason we have artificial intelligence being used in automotive industry cell phone industry and advertisement but it never applied to the economy maybe uh, what what could be our outcome well, from that for one thing i i don't think it's necessary right i and i'm not even sh- I, this is a hard question i think and i'm i'm struggling with it now i mean you know if you'd asked me six months ago about artificial intelligence i would have told you look it's calculators are useful artificial intelligence will be useful for some things silly for other things but it's no big deal and there's a sense in which that's still true artificial intelligence i don't know how much time you want to spend on this but artificial intelligence began back in the mid 50s right and it was meant to be a research program to understand how humans think how humans do language how humans have consciousness well artificial intelligence has been a total failure from that point of view it hasn't taught us anything maybe anything at all certainly nothing more than a meager amount i think really nothing at all about how humans do things right um so in that sense, it's irrelevant. And that's what I would have said six months ago. But now, um, very smart programmers have made a lot of headway, not in doing things the way humans do things, not in revealing something about human consciousness or human thought or human even use of language, right? Um, but they have made a whole lot of headway in making programs and therefore machines that have those programs uh, function uh, vastly better than I had anticipated. But does that have any bearing on um, participatory planning? You could use, see, what, what, what would it mean? It would mean uh, the planners or the plan outcome is using algorithms to figure out where it's going and to shortcut getting there. You see what I'm saying? In other words, imagine you have that central planning system. So what would you use artificial intelligence for in a central planning system? Well, so the central planning system first looks at all sorts of information and proposes a plan. Well, you could have the artificial intelligence do that. Then the plan is distributed to all the workplaces and you get back reactions. You could have the artificial intelligence receive all those reactions and propose modifications and then send out rules. So, yes, you could imagine using artificial intelligence for that. Does that make central planning any better? No. Uh, yeah, well, it might make it arrive at an outcome that is better, but it doesn't make it deliver self-management the opposite right it doesn't do that in participatory planning are there places where you could use artificial intelligence yes um I, I, to describe that remember i said you have workers councils and you have consumers councils and you have this mechanism that has them essentially making proposals, reacting to proposals, moving toward a plan. Well, that process, that, that, that trajectory, right, involves um, proposing some uh, intermediate prices. Um, we call them indicative prices. Um, they're not the final price, but they're indicative prices that are, are, that are evolving toward final prices. And you could have artificial intelligence help with setting those prices. You don't have to have it, but you could have it. And that wouldn't hurt participatory planning. It wouldn't make it less of a self-managed 
thing. Um, so it can have an impact. Uh, the Chile example is important uh, because of the will, because there was the desire to try to do this, right? Like there was the desire, I mean, you could make a case that in the early days of the Cuban revolution, there was that desire, but um, the opposition of the United States and the alliance with the Soviet Union and the need for Soviet um, materials sort of reduced the flexibility with which you could pursue trying to do some kind of participatory planning. Um, the Chile case says, well, the United States is going to try and overthrow efforts in that direction. And both are true. Um, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, the, way you, the way you prevent power from being used to repress and subvert change, and now we're talking about winning that $15 an hour or $20 an hour, or instituting um, public ownership, or instituting participatory planning or a new division of labor, could be any of those things. The way you stop power from intervening and, and causing havoc and preventing it is almost always going to have to be to create a situation in which for power to behave that way hurts power. So in other words, if there had been a situation in which for the United States to, in, to overthrow Allende or to uh, uh, subvert Cuban developments or to um, hurt the uh, Venezuelan economy sufficient uh, to cripple the capacity for experimenting in these kinds of new directions there and so on and so forth. You have to create a situation in which the use of power by the United States to those ends would hurt the interests of the people who are making the decision to use the power. In other words, it would have to be the case that grassroots activism, grassroots sentiment, popular sentiment in the United States was so, so strong that the ruling elements look at the situation and say, I want to get rid of Allende. I want to overthrow him, or I want to, um, whatever the case may be, I, I want to, at the local level, crush the Amazon movement for higher wages and more, more say in the workplace, right? But I see that my doing that is going to actually do more damage than good for me, me, the, the powers that be in the United States. It's just like if you call a strike against Amazon, they're going to crush your strike unless you create a situation in which their effort to crush your strike will enlarge your strike. Right? Now they're in a now they are they are in a problematic situation, right? The effort to crush your strike on Long Island is going to create growing resistance in Amazon plants all over the world. Well, fine, they'll give in on Long Island to avoid. You see what I'm saying? So. You know, the, the Chilean example is important for that. I think it's probably less important regarding the algorithms, which I think, I don't know, I, you know, I'm not an expert and it's not clear that anybody knows for sure, but I think that they were more geared to making central planning effective, ultimately, than they were geared to not having central planning and having instead um, something that we would call participatory planning. But regardless of which they were aimed at, it's no surprise that powers crush or attempt to crush the results. As to why um, uh, artificial intelligence isn't applied that much to economics, I suspect that that's not true. And it's going to become less true as we go along. So my guess is Amazon will use artificial intelligence to help Amazon authorities plan um, the activity inside Amazon workplaces. Um, that's, that's sort of using it in a centrally planned context to facilitate and speed up the central planning. I suspect they will use it to do that.
I don't know, but I think they will. Uh, and that has really nothing positive to say about human well-being and development. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, it it's, uh, seems to be a very complex issue. It's not like one thing or yeah. another. I know we, we've been uh, doing an interview for almost an hour, so let me ask you a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, just... I, I'm yours for as long as you want. Okay, very good. Uh, so uh, for organizing such self-governing society, which tools uh, can be used by the people or by people who decided to self-organize in order to create? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, but mm -hmm. there's participatory economics and there's also participatory polity or participatory kinship or participatory culture and so on and so forth. Okay, so... Um, if you're talking about the economic realm, I think the tool, so to speak, is um, workers' councils, consumers' councils, participation by all workers and by all consumers in a self-managing decision-making process. Um, I don't think there's anything magic about it. You then have to use all kinds of, all right, you're in the workplace and you're going to paint the walls. Right. So your self-managing council has decided, you know, we need a new coat of paint on all the walls. So we're going to paint the walls. Um, well, you have to know that lead paint is not a good idea. So you also have to um, you, you don't say to the chemist, you decide. Right. You don't you don't say that by virtue of having some important knowledge, you get to decide. But you do say to the chemist, tell us this information which is essential to making the decision about painting our walls. So the tools are basically, in that case, the workers' council, the consumers' council, the federations of councils, so an industry council, um, a neighborhood council, a, a county council, a regional council, et cetera, et cetera. And then beyond that, knowledge and the exchange of knowledge. I don't know what to say. There's no... Or, for example, okay, here's another tool. I think it's a tool. See, I think one person, one vote is a tool or a tactic. Consensus is a tool or a tactic. You need three quarters uh, to pass something. That's a tool or a tactic. Self-management is the goal. Sometimes self-management is maybe best achieved by one person, one vote, majority rules. Sometimes it's best achieved by something else, right? And when you go to work tomorrow, you don't think there should be one person, one vote, majority rules about um, what you have for lunch or what shirt you wear or, you know, all sorts of things. And your team is going to decide its activities in context of broader decisions, but not by bringing them to everybody to vote on. Okay, so these are tools, these are tactics, these are things that we use to do this. Now, in the political realm, uh, it's similar. So, in other words, if, if the political, let's call it an assembly, so if the local um, mechanism of decision-making is an assembly, it's sort of like a council, right? And again, you have these various ways of voting and various amounts of time that you allot to discussion and deliberation and so on and so forth. Um, you may need courts, right? You probably do need courts of a certain type, but not like ours, right? Um, you need, um, you can even need uh, what, what are now maybe conceived to be governmental uh, institutions of execution of agreed plans. So say uh, the CDC, the the uh, organization that's established to deal with um, disease, disease control and pandemics and so on. Well, you, you can think of that as a political institution. Um, and so again, but you're going to, you're going to want to understand these things in light of self-management and in light of equity and so on and so forth. Um, if what you mean is what tools can we use to get started? I think the answer there is our mouths um and our bodies that is i mean i you know in other words organizing is talking to people uh, a lot of organizers or activists forget that 
and think that organizing is sending out an email. Now, sending out an email can can be valuable for sure, but ultimately organizing, creating the ties and the connections and the trust and the shared knowledge that's essential to a movement becoming powerful enough to win a sequence of desirable changes and be part of a larger movement seeking a new society, that depends on communication. Uh, I don't don't think there's anything magic there. Um, In your... Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, There is another interesting point that you have in your book, Management, uh, which you co-wrote with uh, Maskan and Hedori. And you say that there are five uh, typical reasons for failures of the executives. Uh, There was a study uh, that was brought up in the book. How do you find the... Just one second. What, What book is this? It's called Management. That's not by me. It's not by you? I don't because think so. There, there is a book says uh, fun, uh, Fundamentals of Management by Michael Maskan, Michael Albert, and Franklin Hadouri. So that's somebody who's... Uh, I believe so. I'm so. I've never heard of it. Uh, it might be... Where was it published? It was published... The one I see on Amazon. The one I see on Amazon, it says... It doesn't say where exactly was it published, but when, when, when was it published? Doesn't seem to say anything. <laughs> no. What's no, the no. name of it again? Uh, it's called Management or Fundamentals of Management. No, that's not. I never wrote a book like that. Sometimes things get translated. So if the book is in Turkish, say. It might have been a translation of a book that I did. That happens. Um, And then they give it a new name, maybe. And they also make changes. So, I mean, it's a strange phenomenon. You're giving a public talk, and um, somebody gets up and said, you said, and then they quote. And I said, I don't believe so. I don't think that, and I don't think I ever said that. And they would raise the book and swing it around and say, yeah, but you did. It's right in here. And it's basically mistranslation. But uh, And that does happen. But I don't think that's what you've got. I think what you have is, do me a favor, and when we're all finished, email me um, mm-hmm. the, actu- the exact name and the, and the author, and I'll look it up for you in a reply. But anyway, if you want me to respond to something that that person said, okay, what did that person say? <laughs> okay, uh, that one was about uh, m- uh, most common reasons for executives to, uh, to fail at doing their job. And I, yes. what I wanted to ask you, if we're talking about this uh, kind of organization where uh, councils and workers... Uh, creating decisions collectively uh what is still the role of executives and management uh, that uh somebody who's taking let's say more responsibility about the execution of processes okay. um this question can be asked in two ways right um i'm not trying to impose on you you know but but it sort of can in other words you could ask what is the what is the um the, the implication or the effect of leadership and of um, uh, smart ideas. That's one way to ask the question. And the other way to ask the question is, what is the role or the impact of someone who holds the job of generating smart ideas or, um, uh, you know, making decisions about what's going on? That's what I take your word executive to mean. And those are two very different things. Um, one of the, the second one is saying in, a, in an economy that has a set of people who are responsible for decision making, in essence, right? Uh, what's their role? And my answer to that is their role is to... Um, it depends on the institution, um, but but let's say it's a it's a workplace that's manufacturing cars. Okay, so what's their role? Their role is to make good decisions about manufacturing cars, consistent with them and an owner, if there is an owner, 
staying where they are in the pecking order, right? So in other words, the manager doesn't get to say, doesn't think to say, is incapable of saying, right, that it would be advisable in our workplace to increase workers' control and to increase their awareness and their knowledge about what's going on, even if that would, and it would, increase productivity. Why not? Because it threatens their power and their wealth and their position. So they're not in a position to do that. So my answer is the role of the capitalist, that's one particular executive, right, kind of executive, the role of the capitalist is to maintain um, their position as owner and to maintain their ability to accrue profits and to maximize profits. And that, that role is pushed on them partly by their own prior experience and, process and, and trajectory of their winding up where they are, and partly by market competition, uh, capitalist accumulation, and so on. Now, there's another kind of person, um, not the owner, but the manager. Um, and I think it's rather similar. His or her role is to maintain and serve the owner to avoid getting fired by the owner and to maintain and serve himself or herself by increasing his or her power, knowledge, and authority which means keeping down those below. So the people between workers and owners, the coordinator class, um, yes, they sometimes are trying to make a decision which would make production more efficient or which would make the product um, more appealing to audiences. They're sometimes trying to do that, but within the constraint that they not challenge the power and authority of other coordinators and of owners okay so now what's the role of intelligence at uh, good ideas leadership um um uh having important information the role of all that is to improve decisions that are seeking human well-being and development and that are decided not by those by the person who happens to have that knowledge but by the workforce so again, if somebody in the workplace is a chemist and tells everybody about lead paint, that person doesn't get to decide what paint is used. That person conveys the information and the workforce decides it. Moreover, you don't want a situation where there's a subset of people who constantly have all the information and constantly have the confidence and the background right, to arrive at decisions, and other people who don't have the information, who don't have the confidence, whose circumstances make them uh, feel alienated and disempowered, because then the former group will dominate the latter group. So my answer is, the role of intelligence and good information and clever ideas is the same as it always has been, right? Actually not. It's the same as we have always described it as being. But it has always been, in fact, not what we describe. It has always been to serve power and wealth and only secondarily to impact products or processes and so on in efficient ways. That's always subordinate. So what's happening is we're removing the criteria of serving profit and power and wealth, we're removing that. And we're removing monopolizing the information and the capacities in the hands of a few, right? But we're retaining the role of expertise, right? To inform and facilitate good decisions. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so it's even the expertise, but uh, not empowering someone with power to dominate. Yeah. Yeah, you, exactly. And, and there's a there's a there's a tricky part of it. If you put all the expertise in the hands of a few people, then they will dominate, right? 
But if you if you have knowledge of the workplace and confidence and and um, awareness and the ability to assess and so on and so forth, distributed well throughout the whole workforce, then the fact that some know more about X and others know more about Y is not a problem, right? Um, and th- and that's what you have to do. What um, what uh, maybe just for purposes of of. There are those who would say, Michael, this is ridiculous. What you're talking about is absurd. You're talking as if all working people have the capacity to participate in decision making, right? And so the critic says, I don't believe that. The critic says, you know, I think the reason why 20% have all the empowering tasks is because they're capable of them. And the reason 80% have rote and repetitive tasks is because that's all they're capable of. All right. That's the that's the going assumption. It's even the assumption of a great many people who are occupying the 80 percent, you know, who are doing the rote and repetitive tasks. It's analogous to going years back in the United States, saying the reason why um, whites predominate as doctors and there's almost no blacks 50, 60 years ago or men predominate as doctors and there's almost no women is because. There's nothing nefarious about it. It's the whites are able to do it. The men are able to do it. The blacks aren't able to do it. And the women aren't able to do it. Okay, so that was rubbish. It was total nonsense. It was a lie. It was a lie to, to maintain that, that discrepancy. I think the same is true for saying workers can't participate in decisions intelligently and arrive at intelligent decisions. The same thing is true. The, it's true that at the moment, absent confidence, absent training, absent circumstances, no one, you know, absent all that stuff can do a good job. But with all that, somebody can. Let me tell you one more story, if I could. I use this one a lot. Now I'm in an Argentine glass factory that was taken over. And I'm talking to a woman and she is, remember, they kept the old division of labor, um, just not realizing that that was even a problem. And so she is now the um, chief financial officer. Okay, so She's keeping the books and, and doing the accounting. And so I, I'm talking with her and I say to her, what were you doing before the owners left, before you all took over? And she said, I was working at this particular um, spot in the glass factory. I said, what were you doing? She said, well, I would spend all day in front of this open furnace, um, putting stuff into it and taking stuff out of it. I said, that sounds incredible. And she said, yeah, it, 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 it was. And, and I went and checked and looked at it and, you know, I would have lasted for 10 minutes. Right. And so she would do that every day, day in and day out. And I said, but now you're doing the finances, you're doing the accounting. She said, yes. She was a little bashful about some of this. I said, well, what was the hardest thing that you had to learn? Right. Now, now the going, the going um, um, explanation is she was doing the, gla- the, the, the glass blowing, the, 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 the working at the furnace, because that's all she was capable of. And so I'm saying, okay, well, what'd you have to learn? And she didn't want to answer, and I kept pushing, and she didn't want to answer. And I said, oh, all right, well, was it to learn how to uh, use the computer? No. Was it to learn how to use the software? No. Was it to learn accounting concepts and how to do accounting? No. And I said, look, I, you know, this is silly. Why am I guessing? Please tell me. And she said, first, I had to learn to read. So this woman went from doing rote backbreaking, debilitating, demoralizing, confidence-destroying work to essentially replacing the financial officer. And she even had to learn to read on the way to do it, and she was doing it. And the plant that was failing was now succeeding. So that's my answer to the person who says working people are incapable of doing other than they're doing. It's utter nonsense. It's like, you know, listen to John Lennon singing Working Class Hero. They, they, the system hammers and beats you until 
you're, you know, eager to take the wage slave position as compared to starving. But that doesn't mean it's all you're capable of. Just like when, and it's still true to an extent, um, patriarchy diminishes women and then they, you know, they, they are doing less than men or racism diminishes blacks and they are doing less than whites. It's not because of some intrinsic incapacity. It's because of oppression and exploitation. And, uh, that's something that has to be, that's not easy to communicate. Um, when the Venezuelans were under Chavez trying to revolutionize the economy, um, I was talking to somebody who had been actually sort of sent by the government to, I believe it was an aluminum factory, but I'm not entirely sure. I don't remember totally. Um, to help with changing the factory to workers' control. And I'm talking with him, and I said, what was the hardest thing to, to deal with? And he said, the workers not wanting to do it. And I said, what? And he said, the workers didn't trust us. They felt that we were just trying to get more labor out of them. Um, we were just trying to trick them. We weren't really going to deliver any real control. We were just going to deliver a, a, a facsimile of it, a semblance of it, and, and get that in exchange, get more work and more obedience out of them. And that's working class consciousness, right? I mean, they were wrong in this case. The people were really trying to, you know. Um, but it, it's a big part of the problem of going from capitalism to post-capitalism or going from bourgeois democracy to participatory politics and so on. You, it's not only a problem of overcoming the uh, opposition of elites, of people who now benefit. It's also a problem of um, arriving at an awareness in the population that it can, should, and indeed must take control of its own circumstances and lives. Uh, so that's part of it also. Uh, well, and that's the kind of insight that comes from having a vision that isn't just you know, better outcomes, no change in participation. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And uh, what we see is that there is a resistance from people for the ideas that they don't understand completely. And uh, we've been seeing this as well because uh, our project, Creative Society, advocates for creating a society in which concept of power will be absent and all people will be executing their power instead of just delegating it to somebody and mm -hmm. today we have technologies that would allow us to do that and uh maybe this concept could be uh better understood by the people if uh, if there was anything to compare it to but as, as such <laughs> concept has never been realized in the history it's uh, right. even explain explanation of it takes uh, takes a tremendous amount of efforts yeah um Thank you so much for this interview. It's been extremely interesting, and this concept has to be much better studied by the people. Hopefully, we're going to input a little bit of efforts into... Let me make a little advertisement, if you will. Um, yes, please. There's an organization called Real Utopia online, on the internet. Uh, people who are interested in the kinds of ideas that I've been, you know responding to you with um those are advocated by real utopia and not just for the economy but also for all sides of social life and for the political system and so on and so forth so that's a possible place to go real utopia.org um and if you're interested in participatory economics per se that particular aspect of the whole there is a lot of works there are various sites um and one particular book that I would suggest, because I know it, because I wrote it, um, is a book called No Bosses. Um, and that does, a, I think, a pretty comprehensive job in plain language of trying to communicate what a post-capitalist 
economy would be like. Sounds great. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today, and it's been. Thank a great you for time. having me. Um, it's my pleasure, and uh, you're the one who's doing the favor, not me. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right.